Um, I didn't have a sexual relationship with Tori. I'm not crawling somebody's driveway. They could kick me and shot me. <laughs> What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts and this week we are talking about a story that is taking the internet by storm and it's about famous rapper Megan Thee Stallion. Just two weeks ago she did an interview with Gail King where she opened up for the first time about an incident that took place with rapper Tory Lanez. Now Megan alleges that Tory Lanez shot her in the foot and this story has completely polarized the internet. Thousands of people are saying, oh she's clearly lying. Thousands of people are saying, oh, she's clearly telling the truth. And in this video, we're going to take a deep dive into her body language, her nonverbal communication, and see where she's being honest, where she's being deceptive, and how you can use these tools to know when people are lying to you in your life. I feel like I wrote my first like rap when I was seven, and I didn't tell my mama, well, I did tell my mama the rap, but I didn't tell her I wanted to be a rapper, but I saw her rapping and I would go to the studio with her and I would like sit in the waiting room, waiting at the door, listening to what she in there saying. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that's not fire. I like that. <laughs> Girl, I could do that at seven. I could do that. This is one of the things I love most about this interview is that we're not starting by talking about the stressful incident. We're talking about other things from her childhood, other things that require her to think back. So we see what her recall baseline looks like what she behaves like when she's actually thinking honestly of something in her past. And there's a lot of information we're getting here. Always remember, baseline is super important. To spot deception, we have to see clusters of odd behaviors that deviate from baseline. Megan is extremely animated when she talks, and this is very common with performers of her caliber because they have to be very expressive when they're up there performing. So there's a lot of activity in her eyebrows, and that's gonna help us a lot in later clips, but notice how as she talks, they go up and they go down, and when she's curious about something, they go down. When she's excited about something, they go up, so she has a lot of movement up there. Another part of her that's very active is her left hand. As she talks, she gestures a lot with her left hand and does what we call illustrators. Illustrators are movements we make to really push the points home, and they're usually synchronized with what we're saying. And her left hand is really, really active. But why is it just the left hand? When she's on stage rapping, she holds her microphone in her right hand. But as a performer, she has to drive those points home, be animated on stage, and she's used to doing all that with her left hand. Notice how rappers really sync their movements with what they're saying. So she's very used to illustrating more with her left hand than her right hand who's holding the microphone. Now this difference between her left arm and her right arm is going to be very important later because even in this clip, we see twice when she's talking about her mom, her left shoulder goes up as she's saying something. Typically when we actually don't know something, both shoulders go up quickly and then they drop. When we see only one shoulder rising and coming down, this typically means that they're not very confident in what they're saying and there might be some missing information. Again, baseline is very important. There are people who deviate from this norm, but it's a pretty good generalization. But for her, it's not gonna be that important because she in general gestures much more with her left side. Another great piece of her baseline that we're getting here is her eye accessing cues for recall. Now there's a lot of myths out there on the internet and I see this even in my comments very regularly that when people look to their left, they're actually recalling because they're accessing the logical part of their brain and when they go right, they're creating because this is the creative side so when somebody looks to the right, they're making it up and left means honesty. That is a giant misconception. It's been proven again and again that it doesn't work at all because we all have different ways of recalling things. We build a different baseline. So the best way to know what someone's eyes do when they're actually recalling is to look at their baseline. So here as she's actually talking about her childhood, we see her eyes go up into her right as she recalls certain elements, then she looks at Gail, then she looks down into her left. So this is where a lot of her recall is happening. Again, this is a generalization. We're very complex beings. You can't just look at someone and be like, oh, they look to the left, they're lying. It's not that simple. All right, now we're gonna jump into the actual story of her talking about the incident and see what her shifts in body language indicate about what happened on that evening. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavior analysis. It was an argument because I was ready to go and everybody else wasn't ready to go. Mm -hmm. But that's like normal friend yes. stuff. Like, yeah. we fuss about silly, silly stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. But... I never put my hands on anybody. I never raised my voice too loud. Like this was one of them times where it was like, 
it shouldn't have got this crazy. Okay, so now we have the prologue of how things led up to the main event. And there's a lot of interesting language here. First of all, a lot of what she's saying is like a preemptive defense. Like, you know, we always get into silly arguments like these and they don't end up going down this path. So that's a big clue here that in her head, even to herself, she's trying to sort of walk through this and go, it really shouldn't have escalated to this. To whatever happened, it shouldn't have escalated to that. She's trying to go back and see like, what could have possibly caused this? Things like this happen all the time. Also notice how her tone is lower. If you compare to the earlier clip to now, in the earlier clip, we're up here as we're talking about our past, we're excited. And here the tone is slower, it's lower. And her left arm isn't moving anywhere near as much. She is not as animated. So typically when we're stressed, our tone goes down and we move less. It's a way to draw less attention to ourselves. Now, a lot of people saw this and they go, oh, she's clearly lying because, I mean, look at her, her whole demeanor is different, but it doesn't necessarily indicate deception. I actually wanna get that out of the way right now. A lot of people watch videos like this or other people on the news and they go, oh, she's obviously lying. She's obviously telling the truth. There is nothing obvious about this. Yes, we are seeing signs of stress. Yes, I'm gonna point them out, but there are three reasons she could be giving symptoms of stress. One is because she's being deceptive. It's a possibility. Two, because she's talking about a very stressful event. Obviously, we're gonna see stress come out. According to her narrative, she was shot in the foot. It's normal to see stress with that. And third, she's highly scared of not being believed. And I've said this on the channel again and again, when we are scared that people are not going to believe us, we display the exact same signs as someone who's being deceptive. So even if you're looking at this going, she's obviously lying, you could very well be picking up on cues of her being scared that people won't believe her. So I'm not gonna let my emotions or my intuition get the best of me here and tell you, oh, we're obviously seeing this or she's obviously doing that. I'm gonna tell you what the research shows us. What I've studied through my degree in this, with my certification in this, and over 10 years reading people professionally for a living, not what professional social media commenters consider to be obvious. All right, speaking of research nonverbal tells, when she says, you know, we argue like this all the time, we see a lip compression. Now her lip compressions are really specific because she has full lips and she has the makeup, we don't see these tight lip compressions, but we see the tightness around the mouth. And in that moment, as soon as she says that, we see that tightness around the mouth and lip compression is usually withheld opinion. There's something we're not saying. And I think she wanted to keep going, but she stopped and sort of had this inner monologue because we see her looking downwards like this and Often, again, this is a generalization, when we get deeply emotional, our eyes tend to go downwards as we're in her monologue. So she's talking to herself here. She's revisiting that. And we see her sort of like, like she, she can't piece together how things escalated to this point. And right away after that, we see something that is consistent with anger and even more withheld opinion. We see the tongue on the inside sort of doing that. It's subtle, but we see that. And that is what we call pacifying. Pacifying is any gesture we do as self-soothing, to calm ourselves down. So I think as she's thinking back to that night, she's feeling that anger. There's again another lip compression. That one is even tighter because we even see the lips compressed for a sec. So I think there's something here that she's, she's holding back, some sort of anger, because when the teeth come together like that and the jaw moves to the side, there's anger there. There's something here that she wants to express. Like, I think she just wants to scream like, this should not have happened. Then after a long pause, we hear her say, I never put my hands on anybody. I never raised my voice too loud. And this is what we call an isolated denial. Notice how the words are so specifically chosen. I never put my hands on anybody. So she didn't hit anybody. I never raised my voice too loud. So what's happening here is we got this inner monologue. She's revisiting it and saying, did I contribute to this? Did I contribute to the escalation of this? And I think that she believes that she did in some way contribute to the escalation of how things got out of hand. But it's not because she hit anyone. She didn't raise her voice too loud, but she could have raised her voice and maybe said some hurtful things. And I think that's exactly everything we saw here. Looking down, thinking about it, getting angry, lip compression. Maybe there's a part of her that wants to say, okay, you know what? I did say some things I shouldn't have said. So she's thinking about that. I think we're getting some omission here, things that are being held back. And then finally she goes, you know, but, but regardless of what I hit, may have said, I didn't hit anyone and I really wasn't that loud. So it couldn't have been that bad. 
Right at the end there, we see the early onset of emotions of grief and sadness as the inner corners of her eyebrows start to go up. This is something that's pretty difficult to do. It's hard to fake and it only happens in real sadness or grief when the inner corners go up like that. I can't fake it, some people can. And we also see her voice is starting to quiver. It's starting to shake. So in her head, she's getting to the sad slash grief part of this story. So I asked the driver to pull the car over, like I'm done with this and I should have stayed out of the car. Like I should have not got back in the car. Mm -hmm. And they was like, Megan, just get back in the car. We almost there, like just get back in. Mm -hmm. So I get back in the car. It's like it's getting worse. The like, arguing in the car. The arguing in the car is getting worse and I don't want to be in this car no more. Like, cause I see it's getting crazy. Mm -hmm. So I get out the car and it's like, everything happens so fast. Yes. All right, so that's one of the clips that I think a lot of people base their judgment on to say, well, she's obviously lying. Look at her. There aren't any signs of real sadness. But remember a very important thing. The absence of emotion in and of itself is absolutely not a direct indication of deception. Okay, that sounded a little complicated. Let me explain what I mean. When we're looking for deception, we're seeing for clear signs that appear in clusters. Things that are happening that let us know that there's a fabrication happening in the brain, that the person's trying to make things up, that they're stressed, and we're not seeing those things either. So sure, maybe there's an absence of extreme emotion here, but there's really not much that would indicate to me that there's deception either. Let's look at some of the things that are happening. First of all, she's, she talks about the driver, what she said to the driver. Liars very, very rarely implicate other people in their lies. Is it impossible? No, but it's rare because you're adding layers. You're adding people that they can go talk to and if they go talk to that person and the story doesn't check out, it's obvious that you're a liar. So the fact that she's pulling someone else into her story means that at least partially a lot of this is right. Second, she's speaking about the incident in the present. It's not, I went out of the car. I didn't want to be in this car. She's saying, I don't want to be in this car. I ask the driver. Everything is in the present. She's stepping into the moment. The fact that she's reliving the moment in the present is also really important to the emotion that she's feeling. She's not at the part of the story yet where she got shot or saw the gun. She's just talking about the argument, the fight, how it escalated. So that would have been a moment of shock, maybe a little bit of anger. So it's quite consistent that we don't see her getting super emotional here as she talks about how it led up to the event. Please remember something as you watch this. We all experience emotion in a different way. Just because you would cry here or you would break down or you would look different, it doesn't mean that it applies to everyone. The most reliable thing we can do is look at the science of it and the science says that a lack of emotion is not necessarily deception. So based on what body language teaches us, is what we just saw deception? No. Is it honesty? No. It's nothing. It's her telling the story and there isn't overwhelming evidence in either direction in that clip. But let's look at Gail. Gail is an incredible interviewer, one of the most prominent interviewers of our time. And as she's interviewing her in this moment, look at Gail's face. Her inner eyebrows are going up. She has a very soft tone in this moment. And we absolutely 100% see the grief muscle up here and down here. There's some tension in the chin and up here. She is emotionally connecting with this. Now, this is a very experienced interviewer and there's something here that she's seeing that's making her sad. So maybe we're not seeing it. We're not in the same room. Maybe we're not quite feeling the vibe here, but Gail is definitely feeling some grief or sadness here as she listens to the story. I hear this man screaming as he said, dance. And he starts shooting and I'm just like, oh my God. Like he shot a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And I, I so was is so he scared. in the car shooting from the car, Megan? He is he? standing up over the window okay. shooting. Mm -hmm. And all right, so that is a roller coaster between honesty and deception. There is a lot going on in both directions. Let's start with the beginning. So as she's recalling that specific moment, the, the one where it all went down, we first see her looking up, which is consistent with her recall, up into her right, as her eyebrows are coming down like this. And usually when she's recalling, it's like these quick flashes, but here she has this, a lot of tension in the eyebrows over here, as she's really trying hard to recall. I think there are parts of this that are missing in her memory, and she's really trying hard to find exactly what happened. Then we actually do see a small cluster of deception pertaining to one specific part of this. 
and it's the part where he would have said dance B. We see her eyes go up and to the left. That is excessively rare when she's recalling. It really doesn't happen often in this interview. So again, remember what I said earlier, up and to the left, up and to the right doesn't have a general rule, but when you know someone's baseline, they go up here and down there, and now they're going up here, that's a little odd and out of place for her. She's also sort of muttering this part of the story. Her voice is much lower, she's speaking much faster, she's saying, you know, this man is screaming at me, dance, and it's kind of muttered, and we see a lot of heavy grooming with the hands. She's fixing her hair. Now, she does this every now and then with one quick thing like this, but here she's really fixing herself. Grooming is something that we do to make ourselves appear more presentable, and it is consistent with deception within a cluster. Remember, nothing means anything alone. So I'm be like, oh, I, I fix my hair all the time. If you do it all the time, it's part of your baseline, and if you do it alone, isolated, it doesn't matter. But part of a cluster, it's interesting. As she's grooming, we see an eye flutter. The eyes blink really quick. This is when we're trying to process something, trying to get our words out. So she's really trying to talk about this event of like him yelling this thing, but we're seeing a lot of things that are inconsistent with her baseline. So what does this all mean? To me, it means that I don't think that she 100% heard him say dance B. I think she was panicking. There was a lot going on. I think she heard different things, picked up a word here, picked up a word there. And throughout the months, while telling the story again and again and again to people, her, her mem cause our memory does crazy things. Our memory edits all the time because other memories get jumbled up. We, you know, we, we add our own narrative to it. So I think what happened is in telling the story again and again, this is where she landed. She landed on this is what he was doing. This is what he was yelling. And she believes to a certain extent that a version of that happened, but I don't think she specifically believes that he was yelling those words to her in that moment. Now, please keep in mind what I said earlier. Although this is a cluster of deception and an interrogation, this would only indicate to me that I need to ask a few more questions about this dance event. It doesn't necessarily mean that she's 100% lying. Obviously, this is stressful. Obviously, she's scared that people may not believe her. So this grooming could quite simply be her comforting herself. The eye flutter could actually be her trying to recall. Like I said, human behavior is a complicated thing. And when we see a cluster, it raises the likelihood of deception, but it never means that's for sure deception. All right, and after that interesting cluster, we go right back to something that looks quite honest because as Gail asks her where he was, we see a few things. First of all, as she says, he was standing up over the window shooting. Her illustrators are on point. Those gestures are on point. Her eyebrow flashes with shooting. The eyebrows go up and this can mean a couple of things. It can mean emphasis, like you would not believe what he did. So with surprise, our eyebrows go up. It could be a seeking of approval. She's trying to connect with Gail over this moment. It's one of those two things, but listen to that. Listen to what she said. He's standing up over the window shooting. That's such, a, that's such a bad way to describe something. Is he, is he in the car? Is he out of the car? Is he standing up out of the window? Is his upper body out of the window? It's very non-specific. And for someone who made a living and she is known for freestyle rapping, for being really good with words, she didn't take care to curate that and try to sell us this image of like, you know, he was standing this way, his body was coming out, his right arm was by his side, his left arm. She didn't really try to sell that. Now, typically, not always, liars try to really sell, really try to paint this vivid image for you. When given an opportunity to do that, she didn't take it. Truth tellers are usually more concerned with the facts. Liars are more concerned with the way they present the facts. And there isn't really much care here as to how vividly she's presenting this. It really sounds like she's just speaking her truth because standing up over the window that doesn't really paint a very vivid image in my mind. I feel it, but I don't understand what's happening. So I look down at my feet and I'm like, oh my God, like I'm really bleeding. Mm -hmm. So I like drop down and I crawl in somebody's driveway. Mm -hmm. Like I can't believe you shot me. <laughs> and what is he saying, Tory Lane saying? He's after apologizing. He He's like, I'm so sorry. Please don't tell nobody I'll give y'all a million dollars if y'all don't say nothing. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you offering me money right now? Help me, like, and if you sorry, just help me, like. That is another clip that a lot of people are using to say, oh, there's no real tears. Obviously she's lying. I've, 
I don't know how you can look at that and honestly think that that's deception. There's, there's so much going on emotionally. First of all, this is the segment where we see those inner corners of the eyes go up like this the most. This is sadness. We're also seeing two other indicators of sadness. One is the inner corners of the mouth are going down like this to where we even see a bit of those lines on the side of the mouth and the upper eyelids are drooping and she's lifting her head like this to look down at Gail to keep that eye contact. So downwards eyes, droopy upper eyelids, eyebrows going up like this and the mouth being relaxed. All of those things are scientifically proven signs of sadness. You know what's not a scientifically proven sign of sadness? Crying. First of all, crying can happen with a range of emotions. It can happen when we're touched, happy, angry, sad, surprised. It can happen with a lot of things. It's not a clear indication of sadness. And furthermore, not everyone who's sad actually cries tears. So to look at that and go, I'm, I have tears when I'm sad. She doesn't have tears. She must not be sad is a really silly thing to say. All the other signs that indicate sadness are on her face. They also shift later to anger as she's talking about why are you offering me money right now? Look at the cadence there. She's confused. She's angry. I don't want money. I want help. And we see her actually processing this like, why would you give me money? Why would you offer me money? That's also a really strange thing to make up about somebody. If you're trying to sell this idea of somebody having shot you, you're not going to make up this narrative that they came to you and started offering money. That's such a bizarre thing. You would focus on painting them in that moment as a deliberate aggressor. But she's talking about what he said after and how she's confused. She's like, I don't want that. Help me. That's real. Here's another note about this whole tears thing. For those of you who think it's really important for her to cry tears. She may not have tears rolling down her face, but listen to her sniffles. In this clip, in the upcoming clips, they're very wet. So that moisture you're looking for is there. When she sniffles, it's not a dry... When fake people try to like sell that sniffle and they go... It's very dry. With hers, there's moisture there. Give y'all a million dollars if y'all don't say nothing. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So yeah, we may not be seeing gushing tears, but what you're looking for is actually there. Am I saying that that is 100% honest and that I would bet my reputation on the fact that that actually happened? I'm not. I'm just saying that I'm not seeing a cluster of deception or deviation from her baseline to tell you that that is deceptive. And furthermore, I'm seeing real emotion. So did that happen exactly that way as a fact? Not necessarily, but thinking about that moment is definitely getting her extremely sad, extremely angry. So something close to that did happen according to her. There's not enough deception to think otherwise. Like somebody had already called the police and it was like so many of them, it was helicopters. I was like, oh my God, we all about to die. Like the George, the George Floyd incident had just happened. The police are definitely very much shoot first, ask questions after. Why did want... you say that? Why didn't you say you shot me? I didn't, for some reason, I was just trying to protect all of us because I didn't want them to kill us. Like even though this person just did just did this to me, mm -hmm. my first reaction still was to try to save us. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't want to see anybody die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so here uh, again, she refers to him as this person just shot me. Again, it's not Tori. There's psychological distancing there. Now, it's not within a cluster in this case. Usually in a cluster, I pay attention to that kind of thing. And also, in this particular situation, psychological distancing does make a bit of sense. It's like, this person shot me. That's not my friend, Tori. That's not the guy I know. I don't recognize this person. Here she has a narrative of how she didn't want to tell the police about a gun because of the recent George Floyd incident that had happened at the time and that she didn't want them to get killed over this. And there's this protective instinct. And a lot of people are talking about like, this is just her playing that card for sympathy. And a lot of people are saying, we totally understand it would be the same for us. My only comment is this, I can't comment on this. There's so much about this life experience that I can't connect with. As a white person, I don't know what it's like to be scared in that situation. So I'm nobody to judge how authentic or inauthentic that fear was. Again, I'm not seeing enough deception here. Um, is she playing this card for sympathy? It's possible. I, I can't comment on that. Also, it's not just a race thing. It's also a culture thing. I think there's something about hip hop culture or rap culture that I don't understand, that I can't speak to. So this is something where as much as I'm qualified to talk to you guys about the behavior, this is not something I could talk about. But if there are people who understand that culture and who associate with this kind of experience, we look forward to your comments 
down below. And there are still many people, as we sit here today, Megan, that don't even believe you were shot. The, there is um, a hot gun in the car. Yeah. What, what else, what, what happened? They look forward to addressing Ms. Pete's claims, including her inconsistencies, discrepancies, and omissions when his case goes to trial later this year. So now there's a medical report and Megan is asking a very important question. She's going, you know, there's a gun in the car, there's a hot gun, what happened? If what I'm saying isn't what happened, what happened? And there's a really interesting statement by Tory Lane's attorneys. We look forward to addressing Ms. Pete's claims, including all its inconsistencies, discrepancies, and omission in a court of law. So besides that statement, as far as I know up until now, Tory Lane's has not publicly responded to this except for in song. So in rap songs, he said some lyrics about the incident and all those lyrics, from what I understand, have been poking holes in her story, saying, oh yeah, well, if it's this, then what, you know, what about that? And you know, what are you saying this for? And it's the same with the lawyers. It's not, we look forward to speaking the truth. We look forward to presenting his narrative. It's not Tory Lane grabbing a camera and going on social media and saying, all right, listen, here's what happened. There's no other narrative being presented. It's just about poking holes in hers. So I feel like this angle is interesting from his lawyers. Why is it that they only want to focus on her discrepancies and her omissions? I agree. There are elements to her story, and we're going to see some more in a minute, that she's omitting something. It's not the full truth. There are a few things that don't add up. But if that's the case, why isn't he flat out to a camera taking an interview and presenting the actual narrative that he claims happened? Why is it just poking holes in her version through rap songs and lawyer statements? What was the nature of your relationship with Tory Lanez? Because he has led, led people to believe that it was a sexual relationship, that it was, uh, that you two were dating. What was the nature we of We were your... not dating. We what were really name? close. We were friends. We hung out like every day. And his mom passed too. So when I felt like we were bonding over, over that. that and did you have an intimate relationship with him? Like sexual? Yeah, yeah. Did you have <laughs> did you Megan? Did you have a sexual relationship <laughs> with Tory Lanez? Yes, that's my question. Um I didn't have a sexual relationship with Tory. I am so happy that this question happened because this is very highly probably deception what we're seeing here. There's a high probability of omission happening here. And I'm still not going to say obviously, by the way, high probability. And we see how bad she is at it. We're seeing a lot of telltale signs here that something is stressing her out. She's holding something back. So someone who's really not that great at lying about something like this, if you go back and look at her previous questions, we would see a lot more of this if she was fabricating entirely the story about the shooting. So I love that we get to compare and contrast. So what do I say that we are seeing a high likelihood of deception here? First of all, when the idea of sexual relationship comes out, when Gail first says that word, we barely see anything on her face. We see Megan kind of parts her lips a little. But besides that, look, this is one of two things. Either she's heard this rumor before or she hasn't, which is unlikely. Let's look at each one. If she's never heard this rumor before and Gail brings it up, we would see surprise. The, 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 the eyebrows would go up, she'd lean in, and she'd be like, what? There might be a bit of a smirk, like a bit of like looking around, like what? Do you, what? If she's heard the rumor before, we'd see an eye roll, we'd see a bit of like, oh, here we go again with this. We see nothing. So that non-reaction is very, very strange. Now I did say earlier that a lack of emotion isn't necessarily deception, but a lack of reaction to a statement like that that's a little strange. I think we can all agree. Then Gail goes on to say, you know, that maybe you were dating and here we get a big isolated denial. She says, we were not dating. There's two really important things there. First is, like I just said, isolated denial. She's not denying the sexual relationship part. She's just denying the dating part because Gail said two things. There's rumors that you've had, you know, maybe a sexual relation or that, you know, you, you're dating. And she said, we were not dating. So imagine if I tell you, hey, listen, I know you were in my office yesterday and after you left, I was missing a laptop, a cell phone and a stack of money that was wrapped in a rubber band. And you go, whoa, 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 I did not take a rubber band. You see what, how that plays out? I'm exaggerating it to illustrate my point, but she only denies the dating part 
not the sexual part. She also says, we were not dating. That is called a non-contraction. And it's not something she uses very often. And non-contractions are when we say, I could not, I did not, we were not, instead of wouldn't, couldn't, didn't. When we're really trying to sell something, we slow the words down like that to make sure everyone comes through. In fact, in research, it has been shown that if a denial has a contraction in it, we weren't, couldn't, didn't, 60% of the time, the person is innocent. In this case, we have a non-contraction. We were not dating, isolated denial. Then she redirects the question and starts talking about, you know, his mom passed too, so we were bonding about this. So it's really like, <laughs> we weren't dating, here's, here's what's really going on. And so sort of like complete changing the subject. Uh, then when Gail asks the question again, now we see another cluster where, first of all, we see long hesitancy. So she's asking like, you know, did you have a sexual relationship? And there's a pause before the answer. I often talk about hesitation, hesitancy, and in certain places it's okay because you have to think about it. This isn't something you have to think about. Did you have a sexual relationship? It's a yes or a no. So she pauses. There's definitely hesitation there. Right at the end of her response, we're also seeing a very subtle duping delight. Now, duping delight is a term that was coined by Paul Ekman, one of the most important researchers on facial expressions and deception. And it's basically a small, subtle smile that we see in liars quite frequently. And it's basically out of excitement and the rush of getting away with a lie. So she pauses, we see an eye flutter. Also in general, her blink rate has gone to the roof. So again, we look at baseline blink rate, how often somebody blinks, and hers here is so much higher than her baseline. So that indicates stress, which contributes to my cluster of deception. So all this together to me indicates that I believe something had happened and she's trying to dance around it and not acknowledge that. And we're seeing what she looks like when she's being deceptive and it really doesn't have a lot of overlap with what was happening when she was talking about the incident. I'd rather it play out in court and the facts come out and everything comes out than me having to plead my case. And I, I'm a victim, like I'm the victim. Like I don't, I'm not defending myself against anything, like something happened to me. So this isn't gonna be an analysis of her body language, we did a lot of that. It's more of an analysis of the narrative here, that she is excited, looking forward to go to trial on this. Cause she's like, I wanna go to court. I want the truth to come out. She's not scared of the truth. She's not scared of coming out, talking about this. And it kind of seems to me like there's a bit of a disbalance there. She's out trying to get this story out and from his side, and again, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm not saying he's full of it. I'm just saying, why hasn't he come out and presented his narrative? I would like to see his narrative. I look forward to seeing his narrative. So overall, what is my opinion of this? Well, I always say this in my videos, I am not a forensic analyst, I am a behavior analyst. And if we look at the behavior, there are moments of deception in this, a lot about her relationship, with Tory Lanez, I think there's some omission. I think she's unclear about certain specifics, so she's giving her best version of it. But overall, I'm not seeing enough to tell you this is deception. So there it was, hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this. There's going to be a trial in September, so maybe down the line there's gonna be a follow-up. I don't know if they're gonna publicly air the trial, that would be amazing. I think it'd be really cool to see Tory Lanez's version of this as well. I would love to see his side of the story. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know and I will see you on the next one.